to chapter 45, verse 19, where Yosef is now telling his brothers to go back and tell their father to come down. So it states, Vata Tsuvesa Zota Su. And so now he says, You're commanded, do this. Take from the land of Egypt wagons for your children, your wives, and take your father and you shall come. Rashi says, Now you're commanded. Me pee by my mouth, Momarlam, to say to them, Zota su, do this, Tachamolahem. Thus you shall say to them, Shebershutihu, it's with my permission. Basically, who's speaking here? Pharaoh. Pharaoh is speaking. Pharaoh is commanding Joseph that you should, you should. You should say to your brothers the following. And you should say to your brothers the following. You shouldn't have to give him permission. He said in last week's parsha that nobody will lift their arm or leg without Joseph's permission. Well, that's the whole irony here that Joseph thinks he's the ruler, but he's not. That's the whole irony. That's the whole irony. So they it also shows him, yeah, Pharaoh's willingness to have this large family come and live in Egypt because they were going to be helpful to him if he saved them. He saved them, yeah. no, but they are going to be do his dirty work, they're going to do his dirty work to work. And this is the old story for Jews throughout the centuries, they need somebody to do the work, the rulers needed somebody to do the work that they couldn't do. And then they kept him around until they were not useful. And then they blamed them for the problems. And your eyes should not have mercy on your vessels. Because the good of all the land of Egypt is for you. Meaning, say, you have the best of Egypt. Mayasu came in Israel, and the sons of Israel did this. Mayitain lam Yosef agawot al piparo. And Joseph gave them wagons on the basis of Pharaoh's command. Mayitain lam tseido aderach. And he gave them something to travel with, um, food for the journey. Tacos and chips to snack on while they're driving. <laughs> to all of them he gave change of clothing. To all of them he gave them changes of clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300, 300 silver pieces and five changes of clothing. Aviv shalach kezot asarach hamorim no sim mituv mitzrayim. And to his father he sang like this. Ten donkeys carrying the best of Egypt, the eser atonot, and, and ten female donkeys no sot bar melechem and mozen laviv wadarach. And and he sent ten female donkeys carrying bar. What is bar? That's grain. And lechem is food, and mazon and sustenance for his father for the journey. Rashi says to his father, he sent like this, like this calculation. Me too, Mitzrayim, from the best of Egypt. What did he send him? Ah, she says, Shashalakwo Yayin Yashan. He sent him good old wine. Shadad Zakanim Nochaimenu. 
Midrash Agada Griesenshaw pool. So they have a dispute. One approach is he sent him good old wine. The other approach is he sent him split beans. Which, is, <laughs> which would you think he'd rather have? Well, if he's really starving, maybe the beans are better. Beans are healthier. What? Beans are healthier. Some is this one of the sources for thinking that Rashi was a mentor? Well, Rashi... There is a the basic source for the for the discounted theory, the the debunked theory that Rashi was a vintner. Oh, has it been debunked? It was it was invented by Professor Jacob Agus writing in the 50s. And he said Rashi was a vintner because in one of Rashi's responsa, Rashi says in a response, uh, uh, he writes, I can't. I can't write right now. I can't respond to you because there's so much going on because it's the crushing of the grapes. So, so, Agus took that as a proof that, uh, that obviously Rashi was a vintner, but he could most likely have meant it's a crazy time here because everybody's involved with crushing grapes. It doesn't mean that he was doing it. So, Professor Chaim Salvechik writes in his article, Rashi might have been a vintner, but there's no evidence to suggest that he might well have just as easily been an egg salesman. That's what he writes. So he was not impressed with uh, Agus's theory. Is the idea that he had a he had a profession other than um, there's uh, there's no evidence that he had a profession. But you should be careful about egg sales. What? He should be careful about egg sales. My grandfather was a he, he wasn't criticizing. He's saying he could have been like a farmer with a chicken, and he was selling the eggs. We have no, oh, no. we have no evidence of any other than Raj. He's saying it's too, a crazy time here because everybody's crushing the grapes. And, and in fact, I, Professor Chaim Salvechik traveled to the Champagne region and says that region where Rashi lived was not actually conducive to wine because the soil was chalky. <laughs> where where was it? He was Champagne in the town of Troyes. T R O Y E S. So I actually okay. passed Troyes on the train when I was going to uh, the wedding of. Funny and grapes. Huh? Now, but back then, Professor Salvechik argues that there was not a lot of grapes back there back then. Or G E U for you. I don't know who just joined us. On the uh, Zoom, who are we honored to have just joined Jerry. us? Oh, Jerry. Okay, perfect. All right, let's go on. And Rash, he says, and what else was he says? That the donkeys are carrying bar valechem, grain and bread, umazon, and, and, and food with on relish. These are things eaten with bread. Okay. Then Rashi says, Vayishalach es echav vayelechu. And he sent his brothers off and they went, Vayomer oyem. And he says to them, Alter gazuba darach. Do not become agitated on the way. Alter gazuba darach. This should be, by the way, something that people should say when they go on their road trips today. But what does Rashi say it means? Don't become agitated. He says, Don't discuss matters of Jewish law. Because then it would delay the trip. And they're going to get involved in a sugi from the Gemara. Everybody's going to get involved in a sugi from the Gemara. And so therefore they won't have time to, um, to really... Um, to uh, sit there and, and travel. He says, your job is to travel, not to discuss Torah at this point. This, we're speaking about Rabbi Salavechik, about Professor Chaim Salavechik. His father was the Rav. And he used to say about the Rav that one time he was driving his car and he crashed his car and then he said, oh, now I understand the Tosfos. That he was thinking about the Tosfos and that's why he crashed. And then after that, his wife took away the keys from him. Alternative explanation, what does it mean? Do not uh, become agitated on the way. 
He said, uh, don't travel taking very large steps. Uh, he said, make sure you enter the city while it is still daytime. Meaning to say, don't travel at night, travel safely. You'll get there all in due time. Don't rush. Waited, we waited all this time. Another two hours won't make, won't won't uh, hurt you. Ufip but the literal explanation, Rashi says, Yesh Shomar is to say that Joseph was very um, worried. Shema Yaribu He was worried lest they fight along the way. over the matter of his sale. He was worried that they were going to dispute with each other. And he said, He was worried that they were going to start blaming each other and say, oh, you were the one who sold this. You told the Lashon Hara. You caused us to hate him. He was worried that all this was going to be there, there that as a result of them. So that's the that's the literal explanation he was saying. Uh, uh, he was saying to them, "On the tro- the road is not that's not the time." Vayegid, verse twenty six. Vayegidu only more, and they said to Joseph, "Say they they said to Joseph." Hold on, you skipped a verse. I skipped a verse. Vayalumi Mitzrayim. They went up from Egypt. They came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they said to Jacob, saying, Oh, Joseph is still alive. He's the ruler in the land of Egypt. Excuse me. And Joseph and Jacob's heart fainted. He did not believe him. What does it mean? Rashi says, He is the ruler. He is the ruler. He had a he had a change of heart. He didn't believe them. He didn't. Rashi says it just means his heart turned away from them. He didn't believe them. That's what he says it means. He, he refused to believe them. Interesting. I would have read it as he had a heart attack. But that's now not how Rashi reads it. Rashi says it means that. Well, it says in the in the sorry, it says in the commentary here it ceased to be, and perhaps he faints it out of shock. Right, that's how I would have read it. But Rashi doesn't read it that way. Rashi reads it saying that Jacob's heart was closed to them. He his heart turned away from them. It is like his heart skipped a beat. That's how that's how I would have read it. That's how Rabbi Shangal three is reading it. That's how probably most commentaries read it. And that's not how Rashi reads it. Rashi says it it turned the other way. Interesting that Rashi takes that read. Well, but you know, what's interesting about that is now the brothers have to come clean about what they did. Not necessarily. In fact, there's a major theory is that that the brothers never told Jacob. Really? Never says that Jacob knows, heard. There's no reference to them ever telling Jacob or Jacob criticizing them for it. He doesn't criticize the brothers for selling, for throwing Joseph in a pit. He knows that some of it was his fault, but never mind that. But I'm saying there's no evidence that they ever told him. Except in the, in, in the end of Ayech, it means that they lied to him. So they lied to Yosef because they said, we uh, Dad told us to to tell you to forgive us. So Well, well, first of all, that doesn't mean that they lied. That that might have happened. He can't. If if he didn't believe them that that if sorry, if he didn't they didn't tell the story that he was sold uh and to Egypt by by them, then then Jacob couldn't have told them for you have to forgive uh you have to forgive your brothers because why we could have mean uh um that they the that our father told us to forgive you, forgive that you should forgive us for not being friends with you or for having fight, but not that it went to this degree. And he says, 
and he says, please, that your father said, please forgive, son of Pesha, forgive their, their behavior. I, I'm saying it's ambiguous. The text is ambiguous. The, the text does not say that they actually told him. But it's hard to imagine that they kept his family secret for so long, but all families have secrets, right? Would we say that? All families they, they needed at least to say, we. Yeah. No, we thought a wild animal ate him, but they, he was obviously taken away and and they threw off his coat and, and that's it. I mean, once you start down the path of lying, then you can go farther and farther and farther. Okay, it's called the Yosef, and they spoke to him all the words of Joseph. Asher Diber Aliyem, and Joseph had spoken to them. Vayaras Agalot Asher Shalach Yosef Latzetoto, and they saw the wagons that jo that Joseph had sent to bring him. Vatachi Ruach Yaakov Avihem, and the spirit of Jacob, their father, was resurrected. And this is to me a very powerful Rashi. They saw all the words of Joseph, and then they believed. What? What? It says they saw the wagons. That they spoke to him all the words of Joseph, and he saw the wagons. Rashi says here, very powerful. This is not in the text, just hinted to. Simon Masarlam, Joseph gave his brothers a sign. Bamayas osei kishepeirash mimenu. He said, this is what I was studying with our father when I left him. What was I studying? The Parashas Egla Rufa. I was studying the passage in the Torah called the Egla Rufa. That's what it says. He saw the wagon that Joseph had sent. Because Paro was the one who said to send the wagons. And here it says he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent. Now, this is a play on words because the Egla Arufa is connected here by Rashi to the Agalot, but to wagons. They mean two separate things. The word Agla is a calf and Agala is a wagon. So there is a pun here going on in the Midrash. And what is what is the passage of Egla Rufa in the Torah? Do you we remember? We remember? So the passage of Egla Rufa in the Torah is the passage of if a man, yeah, Bill. It's about um, expiation for an unknown death. Exactly. If a man, but more than that, for the city, expiation for the city. That that if a man is found on the outskirts of a city or outside of a city, dead, and we don't know why he died, the elders of the city that's closest have to take a calf and egla to a nachal etan, to a wadi, a wadi, and take a calf into the wadi, break its neck, kill the calf in the wadi, and say, our hands did not spill this blood. Meaning we should have escorted this man to safety when he left our town, and we did not do that. And so that's the last passage that they were studying. Is it just random that the Midrash is randomly connecting this because they find wagons to, Egla, to the Egla Rufa? Or is there a deeper message here? It seems that to me that the Midrash is saying, look, what, what did Jacob do? Jacob sent off, sent off his son Joseph outside the city into a dangerous place without anybody watching him. And and his hands kind of were responsible for the blood that was on his hands of Joseph. So therefore, Joseph is sending back this story saying, this Midrash saying, you're responsible. You're responsible. That's a, like a subtext of the Midrash. Uh, I think that's a subtext of the Midrash. So, okay, see, nobody's arguing with me. Fine. Vatachi Ruach Yaakov. And the spirit of Jacob came upon him. Sharta of Shechina, the the divine presence rested upon him. Shepar Shami Menu, the divine presence rested upon him because he it had departed from him. When Jacob's, when Joseph had gone into captivity, Jacob lost the divine prophecy. Yes, Jerry, I see you raising your hand. 
Yes. Uh, this may explain uh, this Rashi that you just uh, read. This may explain why Joseph, in the many years that he was away from his father, never contacted the family. Uh, he was angry at his father for send, as as Rashi says, for sending him into the uh, into the hands of his brothers. The father knew this, and secondly, the father gave the uh, Joseph this beautiful coat, uh, 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 causing the brothers to uh, be jealous and hating him. So, uh, so in effect, uh, Rashi is saying, uh, uh, or, or uh, R Rashi's statement could be an explanation of why uh, Joseph never contacted his father during those yeah. many years uh, that You're he was. You're exactly right. I just want to be fair that Rashi never says directly what I said. It's the subtext of Rashi. Rashi never says it, but it's the subtext of Rashi. But you're right. If if Joseph blamed his father, that could be one of the reasons why he didn't send his father a note all these years because maybe he's worried his father was still trying to kill him. You know, maybe he felt unsafe. Right. Okay, so the next verse says, Vayomer Yisrael, Rav, O Yosef B'nichai, El Chavar Eno B'terem Amus. And Israel, i.e. Jacob, said, Rav, there is a lot. Well, she says it means Ravli Simcha Vachadma. I have much joy since my son Joseph still lives. Oh, Yosef Benichai. I'll go and I'll see him before I die. This is a, uh, this is a, um, a powerful note that he's saying, that he's saying, I need to go see my son before I die. And so Jacob traveled, or Israel traveled, with everything that belonged to him, and he came to Be'er Sheva, and he brought sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Uh, she says, why not the God of his father, Abraham? Why is he only sacrificing the God of his father, Isaac? <laughs> Uh, she says, okay, Aviv Yitzhak, Chayav Adam Bechvod Aviv Yoter Mi Bechvod Zikkeinu. A person is responsible to give honor to his father more than is required to give honor to his grandfather. Afikach Torah Be Yitzhak Vob Avram. Therefore, the verse connects it to Isaac and not Abraham. So you have to give more honor to your father than to your grandfather. On the other hand, your father is obligated to honor your grandfather. To catch 22. And God says to Israel in the visions of the night, He says, Jacob, Jacob. And he says, Hineni, here I am. Oh, wait, let's see where Rashi says, Jacob, Jacob, Washon Chiba. When you say somebody's name twice, it's an expression of love, of love. So you'd say, Jacob, Jacob. And so he says, verse 3, Anochi Akel, okay, I'm the God of your father. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. I will make you a great nation there. Did Jacob did Jacob express any fear? So Rashi says he must have. Jacob was afraid and he had to leave to go outside the land of Israel. So yeah, so he must have been he must have been afraid. He said, Anochi Aradium Khamit Shrima. He says, I'll go down with you to Egypt. Anochi Alcha, and I will go up from there. I will take you up. Gam Alo Dios Gam Alo, and I'll bring you up. Yosef Yashit Yado Alinacha. And Yosef shall place his hand on your eyes. Excuse me, isn't he in fact just restating what he promised him with the bridge being up to him? He says, I will take you up. He promised him that he'd be buried in the land of Israel. And 
and Jacob rose up from Be'er Sheva, Ma'isu b'nei Yisrael at Yaakov ha'v'yem ve'atapam v'nishayem ba'agarot asher sh'arach paro l'asei totel. Jacob got up from Be'er Sheva, and the children of Israel carried their father, Jacob, and their children and their wives in wagons that Paro had sent to carry them. Vayikru es mitneihem, and they took their cattle, that's Rechusham, and their possessions, that Shirach Hashub, Eretz Canaan, that they had inherited in the land of Canaan, Vayavom, Mitzrayma, Yaakov, Kol Zaroito. And they came to Egypt. Why did they have to move to, why did they have to move there? Why couldn't Jacob just say hi and then go back home? And no food anyway. So. Why, well, if Joseph was his son, why didn't Joseph just send them back with some food? But then they would run out. It would last forever. And there was, some, there was yeah, but, it. Plenty of people support people living in different places, like send money back to their relatives in South America or in Africa or in it was China. Back then. What? I think it was a little harder back then. Yeah, well, it doesn't help if you send money. If there's no food to be bought, then there's no... You, you can send money. wagons. You, so you didn't want to send wagons every 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 few months? But you already said that this was the fulfillment of the brief Hey, okay, that was the prophecy. That was the and, prophecy. And maybe that's why he's worried, because this is the second time he's leaving to put starts. The Rashi she says, yeah. Last yeah. time his father was still alive, this time not. Right, so what does Rashi say? But that which he inherited in Padan Aram, he gave it all to Esav. He bought his portion in Machpelah. He says, the possessions of the land are not, uh, are not for me. And this is the implication of which I've dug. He set up piles of gold and silver, come in Cree, like a pot bushel, and he said, Take these. He gave it all for Maratha Machpewa. We'll just do the last verse to finish this uh, paragraph that we'll dive in. And he says, Banavu Bne Banavi Tob, you know, Tabu Bino Banavi calls her Oe Vitum from he brought everybody. He brought his sons, his grandchildren, his daughters, his granddaughters. What daughters? We haven't mentioned any daughter. We have one daughter, Dina. What about his granddaughters? Uh, she says, this is Serach Ban Asher and Yocheved, the daughter of Levi. So Yocheved, we know, she was the mother of Moshe. And who is Serach? Serach is the one who lives a very, very long life because she is the one who revealed to Jacob, that's what the major said, she's the one who told Jacob that, he, that Joseph was still alive. All right, well, time to dive in Minchan at this point. We'll stop our recording.